Now, we know and we've been hearing that the U.S. is facing a $1.3 trillion deficit, but a new analysis shows the situation is actually much worse, that trillions more dollars uh, for 2010 are owed. Because of the way Congress gets to do their accounting, we don't really hear about that. They don't have to report it. Uh, we also know that the U.S. is in $4.4 trillion, or excuse me, $14.4 trillion in debt. And the U.S. national debt is now expected to exceed the size of the U.S. economy this year. That would be a first since World War II. That's according to a Treasury report. I do want to point out that this wasn't supposed to happen until 2014, uh, according to past estimates. Now, of course, the government can't agree on how to deal with this, as we're seeing here in Washington. But joining me now for more to offer their solution, <laughs> it's a tough order, but we're going to try and get right to it, are Heather Sirmo. She is from 440 Group uh, Public Relations, and Caroline Heldman. She is professor of politics at Occidental College. College. Thank you so much for being with me. Now, uh, it's a USA Today analysis that is reporting these numbers that shows that the government actually added more than $5 trillion in new obligations compared to the $1.5 trillion in new debt taken on last year. And this is largely for Medicare and for Social Security. Now, it's not recorded because Congress can postpone recording their spending commitments until it writes a check. Also, the federal debt doesn't take into account what's owed to seniors, veterans, or retired employees, but just what's owed to the public. So this is a, a much bigger picture and a more dire picture that adds up to more than $60 trillion owed in the long run than what we here just talked about in the debt ceiling or the debt negotiation debates. Congress is in disagreement about what to do. I want to ask you ladies, uh, what big picture do you see as the solution? Without getting into too much de detail, but what is the solution, really, big picture for getting this country out of this situation and allowing it to pay its bills. I'll start with you, Heather, because you're in studio. Sure. Well, I think what is easy to understand is compare what's going on uh, with the government to what could, could go on in a household. If you reach your debt limit, you can't just easily raise your own ceiling, uh, which would mean you say, uh, we can take on more credit card debt. The credit card companies won't let you do that. But for whatever reason, the United States has set a precedent to where we can raise our debt ceiling indefinitely and keep on borrowing and, or making money. And uh, that's just not good fiscal policy. And the reality is our, the foundation of our economy can only sustain so much. We already have cracks mm -hmm. and uh, the ceiling is going to start falling on us. Whether you agree or disagree with you, uh, how is the government going to pay the $24.8 trillion it owes for Medicare or the $21.4 trillion it owes for Social Security well, uh, if it doesn't raise the debt ceiling? Sure. Well, that's why we have these negotiations going on right now. We have a Medicare plan from Representative Paul Ryan that we are debating right now. Uh, the Republicans in the House have come behind it, and we're having a debate on that right now, and those are good solutions. And the Democrats have yet to not, come back. But it's not a popular solution with the American people. Well, so I want to switch over to you, Professor Heldman, to ask you, what do you see as a solution to this big problem? Because uh, there are many good points that have been pointed out that, you know, point to the fact that the government can't keep on like this. Well, Lauren, I, first, I think those numbers are a bit soft because they don't take into account the fact that GDP will grow, will have economic growth, will have more revenue, uh, will have a greater population. There will also be alterations in these programs. With that said, the structural deficit problem has been a problem now for nearly a decade. It emerged about 10 years ago. It's emerged at various points, but most recently about 10 years ago. And we know that the primary driving factors are three things. One, our unfunded wars. Two, we have shifted away from taxing the wealthy their fair share. I argue fair share, but there, there's no doubt we've shifted away from taxing them at previous rates. And three, uh, corporate taxation has shifted. So we simply haven't been bringing in the same amount of revenue. All of this compounded by the fact that we're in an economic downturn. So you address those issues and you alter existing programs and we get out of this problem. I want to ask Heather something about that because uh, one of the reasons that the debt is now expected to reach the level of the GDP this year is believed to be because of Bush tax cuts that were extended by the Obama administration that we saw in December. So how can you argue that extending these, as Republicans want to continue to do, is a good thing that isn't hindering this debt situation that you say is a problem? Well, look, we have to cut programs. We have to make changes. We have to make reforms. We have to look at our 
uh, life, really, in a different way. And I would argue that even personally, when you make some sacrifices, perhaps we need to raise your retirement age to 70. Um, so we do need we to, need to raise taxes, though? I mean, is there no, no easy way out of this without I raising taxes? Another, another solution that Paul Ryan also has in his plan is means testing, which means that if you make over a certain amount of money, you shouldn't have to rely upon Medicare. You should still pay into the system, but you don't need to get that. And yet right now, we give welfare, so to mm -hmm. speak, to millionaires. We give Social Security to millionaires. Uh, Professor Heldman, can the country afford not to raise taxes? Well, I don't think we can afford to, I would argue, restore taxes back to their previous levels. I mean, wealthy individuals used to be taxed at a rate of about 90 percent 50 years ago. Um, we're down now to actual rates of around 20 percent. Uh, that could go up quite a bit, I think, and, and there wouldn't be pain. I mean, the fact that, that wealth increased for the top 1 percent, it increased 7 percent during this economic downturn while the rest of us were suffering, that speaks to me that, that the wealthy can afford that. And I would very much agree with Heather that we need alterations to these programs. We do need needs based uh, programming for both Social Security and Medicare so that we're not basically supplementing millionaires. We also need a public option for health care to bring those costs down. We also need the prescription drug plan. We need the government to be able to negotiate with big pharmaceutical companies. And Republicans put that in when they instituted the bill that we couldn't do that. that that's just foolhardy when it comes to taxation, when it comes to our, our money. Okay, I want to get a little bit outside of kind of this uh, partisan debate and look at something that kind of neither sides of the aisle really want to touch, and that is military pay. Uh, defense spending is something that's not a very popular cut, but I want to bring up a graphic to show what exactly the United States is going to be owing in terms of military pay. Uh, these are military retirement and disability benefits. $3.6 trillion, that's $31,000 per U.S. household, and I want to show you how that's grown. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, let's move to that next graphic, they've contributed a 46 percent increase since 2004 in the cost of pension, medical care, and disability benefits for former service members. Uh, this is the biggest jump that we've seen, 71 percent increase since 2004 to $1.3 trillion in the cost of future pension checks to retired military personnel. Uh, the funding shortfall for the disability program rose to $1.5 trillion. That's up 54 percent since 2004. And $900 billion for retiree health care. That's up 32 percent. So how can you not look at defense spending and the amount this country has promised for these wars that it's involved in when you look at the budget, Heather? I think you have to look at all facets of the budget. However, what the uh, Republicans have decided to do right now, it, realizing, too, that any cut is going to be controversial. I mean, we're having a hard enough time uh, just suggesting to make moderate changes to one program. But and bigger picture, should these be cuts that are on the table? I, and is this well, out, of, out think, of line? And should foreign policy be brought into this? I think defense Looking outside spending, of politics. Sure, I understand. I, I think the dis defense spending, though, is, for the most part, a worthwhile expenditure. I, I don't think that we should uh, look too closely at how much we're spending on defense, in my personal opinion. I think that's a very noble thing to spend our money on. That does not mean that there aren't cuts. We have to, there is so much that is put on each bill that we pass, so many things that I would argue the average congressman doesn't know is in the mm -hmm. bill. It, what about 2,000 pages of a bill, you know? Uh, yeah, it's a long bill. I think that sometimes they don't all get read. I, I want to ask you, though, Caroline, what about something like a $220 million doomsday plane for the president that can withstand nuclear blasts and asteroids that's on standby 24-7 in addition to Air Force One. What about things like this that are an expense? I mean, looking at other countries, you know, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, David Cameron, has to charter a plane or schedule, you know, schedule one in order to travel. Are these, like, some of the things that should be nixed? Well, you know, we spend, certainly, yes, we spend more money on our military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us about, you know, 60 years ago, uh, than all of the other advanced industrialized nations combined. Uh, the Cold War, after, after the fact, we found out that the arms race was about 10 times what it should have been in order to keep us safe. And not only do I have an issue with the amount that we spend, but we're also spending it oftentimes unconstitutionally when the president is going into war without congressional approval at horrible cost to the human lives involved. We see uh, major issues now with mental health because so, so many servicemen and women are going back into battle again and again. And of course I want to honor their service and their pension should not be touched, but we need to think long term about what our priorities are as a nation. All right. Well, I want to thank both of you ladies for, for weighing in on what you think could be done. Of course, we still don't know how our bills are going to get paid in this country to everybody that is owed. But we certainly want to thank Heather Stermo from 440 Group Public Relations and Caroline Heldman, Professor of Politics at Occidental.
Continental College for their insight.